All eyes are to the north for the expected Israeli response to the deadly massacre caused by a Hezbollah rocket attack in the Golan. The security cabinet gave its green light to retaliate, but it remains unclear when and how severe the Israeli response will be. More from ILTV's Steve Leibovitz. The security cabinet has given Prime Minister Netanyahu and Defense Minister Gallant the green light to order retaliation for the rocket attack in the Golan Heights that killed 12 youngsters and wounded many others. Hezbollah has reportedly abandoned posts as Lebanon hunkers down ahead of an expected Israeli response following the deadly attack at the Majd el-Shams soccer field. Israeli jets hit targets in South Lebanon during the day and reportedly shelled sites as Lebanon braces for Israel's expected reprisal and diplomats scramble to keep the conflict from snowballing. Ministers authorized Netanyahu and Gallant to choose the manner and timing of a response. Members of the Druze community held funerals amid fury and grief over the tragedy, amid already seething tensions after 10 months of nearly daily rocket attacks on northern Israel and tit-for-tat strikes in South Lebanon. Fearing an impending Israeli attack, Lebanon's Middle East airline said it's delayed the departures of some incoming flights set to land in Beirut airport. Western diplomats said there are significant efforts to head off a major Israeli reaction that could spark a full-blown war in Lebanon. We're in conversations with the government of Israel. Um, and again, I emphasize its right to uh, defend its citizens and our determination to uh, make sure that they're able to do that. But uh, we also don't want to see the conflict escalate. We don't want to see it spread. That has been uh, one of our goals from day one, from uh, from October 7th on. Israel Hayom reports a security official saying there may be several days of significant escalation, but Israel is not interested in a war with Hezbollah right now. The goal is to effect a strategic change in the north. Officials are also reported saying they believe that Israel's response in the north will affect the hostage talks, but they're not sure in which direction, whether it will spur Hezbollah and Iran to push Hamas into a deal or the opposite. And joining us now after spending the day in northern Israel is ILTV's editor-in-chief Mayan Hoffman with an update on the status of the injured in Hezbollah's deadly attack in Majd al-Shams. Mayan, what can you tell us? Some good news, I hope? Thank you, Lizar. I'm actually standing here on the side of the road. I pulled over to give you a report from Northern Israel, where I was this morning near the border, visiting medical centers to get a better understanding of the situation of the injured. Here's what I can tell you. It's a phone medical center. There continue to be four patients who are hospitalized, three of them children, one a young adult in his early 20s. The Of those patients, two of them are in critical condition. At Rambam Medical Center, we have another four patients, all of those as well in critical condition, all children. And at Ziv Medical Center in Svat, we have 11 patients of those at least four children continue to be hospitalized. They are in or to be hospitalized, I'm sorry, in the ICU. Um, the situation, however, what I will also add is that the hospitals are bridging. There's a palatable tension on the ground. People know that there could be an all out war or at least some form of an escalation in the near future. The hospitals on a good note are fortified um, at Tafon Medical Center. For the last 10 years, they've been building buildings that are actually completely um, rocket proof. And so they do not have to relocate their patients. At Rambam, the hospital has moved underground. So the good news is that, God forbid, another mass casualty event, the hospitals should be able to continue to operate and treat those patients. Unfortunately, we continue to see the aftermath of the horrific attack as many still remain in critical condition. Thank you, Mayan, for that important update. And now the question on everyone's mind is will Hezbollah's massacre of 12 children in Majd al-Shams and the expected Israeli retaliation lead to all-out war? Tensions remain very high in anticipation of an Israeli response. And joining us now with more on this is Professor Eyal Zisel, Vice Rector of Tel Aviv University and an expert on the Middle East. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. So it's clear that Israel needs to respond to this uh, attack in the Golan that killed 12 children. The question is, what kind of a response? You know, the cabinet has given the green light for the prime minister, for the defense minister uh, to retaliate. What are the options now uh, in terms of a military response? 
Well, one option is more of the same, but uh, in, in a different level. This is to say, if Israel uh, attacks uh, on a daily basis, you know, three, four targets in Lebanon, uh, the response will be uh, attacking five, six, seven, twenty targets. This is not a big difference, but the scale is a little bit different. If Israel in the past uh, uh, attack targets deep inside Lebanon, even in the Bekaa Valley, it's almost 150 kilometers uh, north to the Israeli-Lebanese border, well, it can continue to do it. And uh, then there is the option of um, an attempt to assassinate another high-ranking uh, commander uh, in the ranks of Hezbollah. So, uh, maybe it's more of the same, because otherwise to uh, attack and destroy Lebanese infrastructure, to attack Hezbollah targets inside Beirut, will definitely lead to uh, uh, an escalation and maybe even uh, a total war, something both Israel and Hezbollah try to uh, avoid. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll have to wait and see. Israeli sources argue that it will be a decisive attack, it will be a clear response, and yet Israel would try its best not to lead to a, um, a major war. So, mm -hmm. so we need to wait and see what kind of response and what would be the response of Hezbollah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the United States, uh, France and other countries are all already trying to dissuade Israel from a massive response. You know, but if Israel doesn't retaliate significantly, couldn't this uh, simply invite more uh, Hezbollah attacks, as you said, more of the same? Yes, clearly it would be a signal of weakness, apart from the impact on the Israeli society, on the uh, strengths of the Israeli uh, on front, but, 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 but uh, apart from that, it will signal to the Hezbollah that Israel is afraid of Hezbollah, and this will encourage Hezbollah to increase its attacks against uh, Israeli target, and eventually we'll get to the point we are trying to avoid uh, right now, and this is to say, eventually, uh, any single link of weakness will uh, lead to an escalation. I mean, many in Israel are saying now is the time to strike uh, and to strike hard. I mean, what's your assessment here? Should Israel strike Beirut? Would this truly escalate to regional war, or could we perhaps see Hezbollah take the hit and retreat uh, into its bunkers? Because, as you mentioned, uh, you know they're concerned about the prospect of of all-out war as well. Well, those who argue or ask for a decisive response, uh, the question is: first of all, what are the goals and the aims of Israel? To me, they are unclear. I mean, do we want to take revenge? This is one thing. Do we want to, to what? To push the Hezbollah northern to the, the Litani River? Do we want to, like in the case of Hamas, to uh, annihilate uh, uh, the, 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 and destroy the uh, military capabilities of Hezbollah before going to war? We need to answer this uh, question. And then to strike Beirut. What does it mean? One bomb, two bombs? Uh, targeting a military uh, base opposition, targeting infrastructure. So, so, so when you say uh, decisive and uh, strong response, what kind of? I think that uh, what the Israeli sources suggest is that indeed there will be a response, unprecedented, maybe targeting uh, Beirut, but not. You know, many bombs, not many targets, maybe something more symbolic. We'll have to wait and uh, see, because one strike, we already uh, assassinated uh, Salah el Aruri in his apartment inside the Dahia suburb where the headquarters of, of Hezbollah is found. So, so we did it.
and the response of Hezbollah was limited because this was a very limited Israeli strike. So, so, so we need to wait and see. All right, well, Professor Eyal Zisel, certainly many options on the table. We'll wait and see. Thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thank you. And we heard from an expert on the Middle East, but what do the residents of Israel and Lebanon think? The devastating Hezbollah rocket attack that claimed the lives of 12 children and young adults has ignited fear and outrage across the border. In Tel Aviv, residents are calling for decisive government action, while those in Lebanon brace for potential military retaliation. Let's take a look. After a Hezbollah rocket attack killed 12 children and young adults over the weekend, both sides of the border expressed shock and fear. In Tel Aviv, residents condemned the attack on a soccer field in the Jewish community of Majdal Shams, calling it a red line and urging the government to take action. I think this is a disaster. I think uh, this, is, um, this is way after crossing the line. And uh, of, of course, there needs to be action. And maybe this is the time when uh, the government needs to do something about Hezbollah. And uh, because of the whole north practically doesn't exist. And I think this is, we don't want war. And uh, we have enough of, you know, in the, in the south. And, but 12 innocent kids uh, are, you know, are victim here. And it needs to be over. So first of all, it was a shocking incident. We haven't seen something like this in a really long time since October 7th. And I'm not really certain if a military operation is needed or not. In my personal perspective, I think that it is. And the situation right now, as someone who grew up in the north, I, my family is not evicted, but as someone who grew up in the north and spent a, a really long time, like every, every summer we spent a lot of time there, it's a very painful situation that Israelis are not allowed to live there. They're, they're incapable of living there. So in my perspective, a military operation is needed. In Lebanon, Residents are fearing just such a military attack, but attempting to go on with their normal lives. They expressed mixed views toward their futures in interviews with Reuters. In a world where truth matters, stay informed with ILTV News, your source for accurate, timely, and insightful coverage from Israel. Join our community of global supporters who believe in the power of truth and the importance of Israel's story. At ILTV, we bring you the news that shapes our nation and connects us all. If you believe in Israel, if you believe in truth, this is your call to action. Become a part of the ILTV news community today. Visit ILTV.tv and subscribe now. Your support means more than ever. And while all eyes are focused on the expected Israeli attack in the north, the war is ongoing on the ground in Gaza. Fighting continues in several locations as mediators seek a workable recipe for a hostage for ceasefire agreement between Israel and Hamas. ILTV's Steve Leibovitz reports. Day 297 of the war in Gaza. Ahead of a potential hostage for ceasefire agreement, IDF troops in Gaza are focused on rooting out remaining Hamas opposition. In the last day, combat teams eliminated a number of terrorists in face-to-face -face encounters and air force attacks. Israeli forces were reported to have advanced deeper into northern parts of Rafah, where they had yet to take full control. Air Force and fighter jets attacked about 35 terror targets in the Gaza Strip in the last day. The IDF is planning to operate against terror groups in the Berej area, urging residents to leave immediately for their safety after rockets were launched from the central Gaza camp. Also in the center of Gaza, Israeli troops were reported to be battling Hamas in the Tel Al-Hawa suburb of Gaza City. Mossad director David Barnea has returned from Rome where he met U.S., Qatari and Egyptian mediators working on the elusive hostage for ceasefire agreement. At the meeting, the sides discussed the clarifications Israel is seeking to the draft agreement. 
The negotiators discussed the updated proposal for a hostage release deal that Israel relayed to the White House, which includes tougher demands insisted on by Prime Minister Netanyahu. These reportedly include Israeli presence on the Philadelphia axis and the Rafah crossing, as well as the Netzarim corridor in central Gaza. Netanyahu is also demanding a list of living Israeli hostages still held by Hamas in Gaza. Negotiations on the main issues will continue in the coming days. U.S. Secretary of State Blinken said a ceasefire deal now could help defuse the situation in the North. One of the reasons that we're continuing to work so hard for a ceasefire in Gaza is not just for Gaza, but also so that we can really unlock an opportunity to bring calm, lasting calm, across the blue line between Israel uh, and Lebanon. Um, we're determined to, to bring the Gaza conflict to a close. It's gone on for far too long. It's cost far too many lives. We want to see Israelis. We want to see Palestinians. We want to see Lebanese live free from the threat of conflict and violence. Shocking comments made by Turkish President Erdogan, who on Sunday threatened to invade Israel, further escalating tensions between the two countries. His comments were widely condemned as calls are being issued to expel Turkey from NATO. The president of Turkey, Tayyip Erdogan, issued an open threat on Sunday that his country could invade Israel to support the Palestinians. Sadece biz güçlü olmalıyız ki bu adımları da ne yapalım? Atalım. He made these remarks while speaking to members of his AK party at a Black Sea province in northeastern Turkey. Erdogan has been a fierce critic of Israel and since October 7th has become a staunch supporter of Hamas, even hosting its leadership in Istanbul and cutting all ties, including trade ties between Israel and Turkey. And mere hours after his threat to invade Israel, Turkey's foreign ministry compared Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to Nazi leader Adolf Hitler and threatened he would meet his end. Israeli and foreign leaders responded harshly to Erdogan's threats, even calling for Turkey to be ousted from NATO. Israeli Foreign Minister Israel Katz condemned Erdogan in a post on X, comparing him to Saddam Hussein, saying he is following in his same path and threatens to attack Israel. He warned Erdogan needs to remember what happened there and how it ended. Meanwhile, opposition leader Yair Lapid called on NATO members to condemn the outrageous threats and expel Turkey from the organization. And Dutch politician Gert Wilders called Erdogan an Islamofascist, adding that he is totally nuts. He also joined calls to kick Turkey out of NATO. And joining us now with more on the threats of Turkish President Erdogan to invade Israel is Ambassador Alon Liel, the former head of the Israeli diplomatic mission to Turkey. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. So these are outrageous comments uh, made by the Turkish prime minister, a NATO ally. Maybe uh, Dutch politician Gert Wilders got it right when he said this guy is nuts. Uh, maybe, but uh, Wilders is not the Dutch government and definitely not NATO. So uh, I don't think this is the NATO response. I don't think this is the European response and not the American response. And I think Erdogan took into consideration the relative weakness of uh, Israel's diplomatic status at the moment. And he assumed that countries will not rush to condemn him or cause him any damage because of the statements. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it seems that Erdogan uh, truly has embraced Hamas in stark opposition to the rest of his NATO allies. It's no secret he also shares warm ties with Russia, with Iran. I mean, maybe it is time that NATO does reconsider Turkey's membership. I mean, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, you have to remember that parallel to reasonable relations with Russia and China and Iran, Erdogan maintains reasonable relations also with the United States and with Europe. His foreign minister, Hakan Fidan, was uh, about six weeks ago in Washington, 
and they define this visit as an excellent visit. So there is no uh, pro major problem between him and the Western world. He likes to dance uh, on all, all uh, the different courts or to play on all the different courts. So I don't think he's going to pay him a massive price uh, in his relations with the West. And, and again, if he, if he will have these threats, he might pull back, but I don't see these threats uh, to Ankara coming. And uh, maybe he has good relations with the West, but relations between Israel and Turkey are at an all-time low. Currently, there are no official diplomatic relations, no trade between the two countries. How should Israel respond to this latest threat? Yeah, I think this is a, maybe for us the main question. First of all, we have official ties. We have diplomatic ties. All this is happening. All these Erdogan threats are taking place while we have full diplomatic relations with him. We pulled the ambassador and they pulled the ambassador, but we still have diplomatic relations. My guess is that he doesn't want to break the diplomatic link and he assumes that Israel will not do it because of its relative weakness now during the war. I know, not only assume, that he would like to maintain the diplomatic contact. But here, a decision has to be made uh, if we keep this contact. Uh, the diplomatic relations with Turkey started in March 49. It's the only Muslim country in the world that has diplomatic relations with Israel since we were founded. So to have such a decision of uh, breaking the diplomatic link is uh, an historic decision. I'm not sure Israel will do it. All right, well, Ambassador Alon Liel, thank you so much for your analysis today. Thank you. And we go now to ILTV correspondent Devo Klein to give us the latest updates coming out of the Olympic Games in Paris. Devo, what can you tell us? Hi, Lidar. Uh, so we have had an extremely packed day at the Olympics. Uh, the Israeli athletes brought their all. Uh, but let's focus on a few of the highlights coming out of Paris. So all eyes were on decorated Simone Biles yesterday and the Team USA powerhouse, which is currently dominating the floor gymnastics events. However, don't count out Israeli athlete Lihi Raz, who was currently placed 16th for women's vault and qualified the all-around women's qualification event. Raz is competing directly with the USA team and doing an incredible job, so much luck to her. On to Israeli judoka this morning, Timna Nelson-Levy. Uh, she had her initial match, which she won against Slovenia. We also have Baruch Shmailov and Geffen Primo, who also won their initial matches yesterday. Baruch finished his competition after a loss in round 16, while Geffen continued to the quarterfinals, but after two losses, she finished in seventh. In swimming, we have the 200-meter freestyle, where Leah Polanski finished 19th, and Dennis Laktev, who qualified for the semifinals, finished in 16th. In the 100-meter breaststroke, Anastasia Gurbenko finished seventh and qualified for the semifinals, while Adam Maraana finished 28th. Tomorrow's schedule contains more swimming, judo, and sailing competitions, so we'll keep an eye out for swimmer Anastasia Gorbenko. Hopefully, we can come back with some medals soon. Absolutely. We want to wish good luck to Team Israel. And now, let's take a look at the weather forecast. Partly cloudy skies are expected tonight around the country, with temperatures dropping slightly and reaching lows of 24 degrees Celsius or 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Tomorrow, sunny skies are expected alongside warm temperatures set to reach highs of around 34 degrees Celsius or 94 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's a wrap for today's news. For the latest updates from Israel on all your devices, be sure to follow our ILTV channel, subscribe to our newsletter, and explore our website, ILTV.tv. Stay informed with the latest news straight from the heart of Israel. I'm Lidar Gavelazi. Be well, and thank you so much for watching.